What's up, everybody? Brett here, and I'm back today playing some more Battle Brothers. What I think will be... I think I think it's appropriate. It's the final episode of our Lone Wolf campaign. We're going to be leaving behind glorious Ozymandias. And we have found the Icy Cave. So, if I sound a little bit tired, because I just spent like 25 minutes sitting here, zigzagging up and down, starting over here, just like I kind of did in the last episode, and I finally found the Icy Cave. Finally. It's right here. I was like, you know what? I bet it's in the middle of this, like, open snow area. And sure enough, as soon as I went down, I found it. Look how close I had to be. So you have to be, like, within this kind of range in order to see it. Because there's no mountain nearby for me to stand on. I was bouncing from this mountain to this one to this one. Thinking that I was going to triangulate and find anything in the center. Not the case. <laughs> Not the case at all. So we finally found it, guys. The ultimate test. For Aussie Man is. I don't know how long today's episode would be. Uh, we could do a standard hour. Just kind of walk around and take certain fights and just talk. Uh, there's been some news from Blazing Desert, so I'm interested in getting into that. Uh, but in the meantime, guys, before we do any of that, that superfluous talking, let's jump into the Icy Cave. So for those of you who don't know, this came with the Warriors of the North DLC. It is an awesome event with a brand new, well, essentially two bosses. The first one is going to be a 1v1, and then you can go and find, uh, man, what do they call it? The, damn, I've only done it once, so I don't, I don't remember the name of it off the top of my head. I'm kind of embarrassed. Um, but after you, you clear the icy cave, another place spawns, and that's where you face the Irajok in open combat. Uh, but yeah, that, none of that makes any sense unless you know what the Irajok is. We're going to get into that very soon, because the lore itself will, will kind of, uh, explain what it's all about. But, Aussie Man you'll notice I went ahead and equipped the Man Splitter for our upcoming trial. I'm very interested to see how it will uh, perform here versus something like a Great Sword, which is just going to be, you know, standard good. But I feel like the Man Splitter's got to be amazing. So, you know what? Also, before I do anything, let's save the game. Um, one, because I just spent so long uh, trying to find this place and I totally forgot to save beforehand. And two... I'm, um, I might be interested in seeing if, let's say the Mansplitter sucks, testing it against the Greatsword. And I think last time I did this, it gave me the option to bring in different people. So, like, maybe Osbit could go in and give it a shot. Something like that. I don't know. Anyway, guys, let's do it. Let's let's do it. Enough, enough of me. Icy Cave. A cave amidst a sea of snow and rock. A thick gate of icicles keeps your entrance wall, or your entrance well stayed. Okay. All right. You discover a cave in the ice with its maw shielded by a gate of thick icicles. Looking through the icy bars, you find the cave quickly, declines down a steep slope, and toward what may be an underground riverbank that is long since frozen. Something is huddled beside it, hitting the ice with a pickaxe over and over again. The wind whistles as it grates against the teeth of the cave. You call out to the huddled man, but there is no response. It will take some time to chop through this thick ice and get in there. Fortunately, one of the cell swords reports that there may be a rear entrance. It is blocked just as well, but a strong enough man just might be able to squeeze through and face any dangers within. So just as I kind of expected, we could send in different guys. Uh, maybe we could try that. We could just make today's episode all about seeing who could do it. Uh, I think it goes by who has like the highest experience. So it doesn't look like Ozbit's able to go in. Jacob could go in. He's one of the first guys we ever picked up. Uh, but he's, of course, an archer. I don't think an archer stands any chance whatsoever in this fight. Uh, but Ozymandias is the GOAT, the greatest of all time. He'll be able to get in there and just wreck. It says, Ozymandias the Lone Wolf heads off while you and the rest work on the front of the cave. You knock a few of the thick icicles out, letting you see into the cave with better eyes. Just as you do, Ozymandias comes trumbling or tumbling down an adjacent slope and lands right in the middle of the cave and slides across the frozen river and rides up its embankment. He hops to his feet and dusts himself off with a childish grin. In a flash, the huddled man slams the pickaxe into the ice with unhinted power and the shard splinter from one side of the embankment to the other. The clank of the metal and shattered ice reverberates as though lightning itself had struck. Now you can finally see the stranger. He is a barbarian, shelled in broken armor that rattles as he moves. The icy walls mirror his steps, scattering his presence all around the cave in transient sheens, jittery and jutting. His walk is seemingly going backwards despite his advance, as though his shadow were his true self and his fleth the afterimage. Despite being in a cave, his loud voice echoes not at all. An interloper in my midst, 
a mere moment from the mist. These things I shall not miss. He approaches the sellsword like a cold spider unfurling from its trap door. You see that his face is half frozen, and a wry smile squeezes across the half that could still be called flesh. I long to leave this body, my dear fighter. Will you help guide me out into something higher? Man. I just got crazy vibes from this. Vibes, man, the most used word of 2019. Uh, I just got, like, crazy, like, nostalgia from this. Have any of you guys read much Stephen King? Like, like, It, right? But if you've ever read the Dark Tower series, without too many spoilers, but in the last book, you basically come across It. And this is exactly, like, how he talks and how he, like, moves and stuff. It's very descriptive. It reminds me a lot of that. Very Stephen King-esque writing here. All right, Ozymandias, let's see what's going on. Because he's kind of like this roach-like creature that inhabits people's bodies. This, like, joy-sucking spider who speaks in weird riddles. Okay, Barbarian Madman. We'll face him in open combat. Um, man, we've also got... Uh, we've got Battle Brother here. If we need it. So here's the thing. Like where do I step? So this is the Barbarian Madman. He's incredibly powerful. You know what I should do? I should pull up his stats real quick. As we fight. I think if I step here I'm fine. He might be able to step in and take one swing. Oh he's playing footsies. Okay. We'll pass. We'll see what's up. And I can step in and get the first shot. Okay. So before I do that. Just bear with me for half a second. As I just very quickly go. And look up the Barbarian Madman stats. In our next series, I'm going to keep open. I have a dual screen. I just don't use it. Um, I'm going to try and keep open a, a tab so that I can give you guys really accurate statistical information. Because I don't, I don't see a lot of other people doing that. And I think that it's very interesting. It changed the way I played once I knew the real numbers uh, behind their, st their strength. So... According to this, this website here, I'm on Battle Brothers Wiki, he's got 160 HP, which is a crap ton. I've only got 86, so he's almost got double my HP. His melee skill is 80, but his melee defense and range defense are each 10, so pretty low. Uh, we are rocking, and this is where like the strength of it comes in, uh, we're rocking 46, plus we're a lone wolf, so that's kind of adding to our stats right here. He's got two, well, he's unbreakable. Essentially, he's got 200 fatigue, so he will not get tired. Uh, that's just not a thing that's going to happen. He's also got recover, so he's good. Yeah, this is the best part. We can look at his abilities, too. And I'm sorry if this is a little bit boring or anticlimactic, but I think it's very... To me, this stuff is really interesting. Um, he's got resilient battle forge, which we can see if we hover over him. He's got all weapon mastery, so he is a cleaver master... Which is what he's using. So his bleeds count as double. He's got Barbarian Fury. I'm not sure what that is. I'd have to look that up. Barbarian Fury allows two adjacent units to swap their place similar to the rotation. Okay, so it's basically rotation. He's got Crippling Strikes. Brawny, which makes sense. He's got Executioner, so if we get injured, he's going to hit really hard. And Battering Ram. What does Battering Ram do again? Does it say here? Gives stun immunity. Okay, so he's he's immune to stun. So we're not trying to stun him, so that's good. And then lastly, he's got Irajok Regeneration. Will heal for 6% of their max HP at the start of each turn. Wow. Alright, guys. So hopefully you found that informative. I love that. Uh, he's also, because he's resilient, he's basically immune to poison and bleeding. Yeah. So, the reason I brought the Mansplitter is because it hits both the head and the body. So, we're going to attempt to just completely and utterly devastate him. Look at the damage on that. Okay, and he heals a little bit, and he whiffs both of his attacks. We need to keep this up so we can see. Our melee defense is definitely our saving grace here. Holy crap, and we gave him a deep abdominal cut. So he can heal himself, but I don't think he can get rid of his own, uh, his own injuries. That would be insane. Alright, and our armor plating, our bone plating rather, took the first hit there. Let's do it again. 
Holy crap. Split nose. Get wrecked. Mansplitter is doing the Lord's work. All right, he hit me twice this time. So he landed 229%. That's pretty damn good. And down he goes. Absolutely crushed. Four attacks with the Mansplitter. And we're going to get the Champion's Chopper, which is what we've been trying to get for a long time now uh, to give to our boy Osbit. This massive and exceptionally well-crafted warblade is covered with runes and decorations that are typical for the barbarian tribes of the north. So we'll compare it to the cleaver he's currently wielding. I remember it's great, but not it's it's like subtly a, it's subtle in how it's like amazing. Uh, I'll have to go over that in a second. Ozymandias cuts the madman down. His chest armor shatters and flies off his body. Chunks of plate spinning and warbling into the air, and yet tethered together by some strange blue tendrils. Your men finally break through the icy cavern's entrance and slide down the declination. Ozymandias is quite right, nodding smugly as he sheathes his weapon. He's quite all right. Just a crazy F-bomb, Captain. You crouch beside the body. Ice contorts half the flesh, twisting it into nubs of black. And what isn't frozen is flaked by strangely sparkling rime. Despite his grisly state, the madman died with a wild grin still on his face. The eyes are a bright blue, and you see yourself in their gaze. A faceless silhouette. And then the color slowly slips away. Not like you've seen before, but as though someone were dragging a curtain through a window, slowly sucking all color right into the sockets. The corpse grins at you, but you refuse to believe that is what you saw. One of the mercenaries picks up the madman's bizarre armor, and holds it at length. What do you figure this is? The plates dangle from one another by some strange blue gelatin, and the insides of the metal slats are coated in bubbling, twirling blues as though it were the work of some celestial blacksmith. It is cool to the touch and gives beneath the slightest push of your finger. You've never seen or felt anything like it, but the armor itself is currently in an unusable state. You have the goop and armor put into inventory. Scour the cave for more goods which there are none. Before you leave the cave, you glance at the corpse one last time. You think you saw it move again, but surely it is the cold of the frozen north that is playing tricks on you. So you get the broken ritual armor, which you can repair, but you have to find the second location, and you have to actually face the Irajok. And it turns into what is... I mean, what's got to be the most powerful armor set in the game? I have yet to see the... Um, in person, at least, as I, as I do my own Let's Play, the armor that you get for... Uh, being a cultist, like the super like human skin armor that's like really crazy. Uh, but I, I feel like the Irajok armor, the regeneration you get from that has got to be the best. As you depart the cave, a local northerner covered in bear fur stands across the company. He looks at you and then the cave entrance, he asks, Do you speak the southern or native tongue? Keeping your guard, you confirm the former, he nods. And what did you see in that cave? Did you see it? You tell him you found nothing, only a madman. The stranger smirks. A madman. A madman, that is what you think you saw. It is within us all to speak warily of the unnatural, but not within us to recognize when nature herself takes a step back. Horrors are easier said than seen. That was no ordinary man, you fool, but the Irajok. A transient spirit that shifts from one vessel to another. No one really knows what it looks like. The whole world is simply a series of masks, and it will happily go from one to the other, usually taking the shape of animals. Sometimes a man, if he is so weak. It is a being of absolute malice. It cannot be killed, no. It sees death, even its own as entertainment. It remembers those who escape it. It remembers those it wishes to play with. I pray you a face worth forgetting. You put your hand on the pommel of your sword and tell him that whatever mysticism and myth-making he's got left, he can keep to himself. You saw the madman in the cave, and that's all he was, a man. The stranger nods again and backs off. As you wish, and may you travel well. We did it. All right, so let's compare this to this. That's the closest comparison we have. And we've got this broken ritual armor. Perhaps there's some way to mend it. There is. We got to kill the ear jock. Uh, but Crypt Cleaver here. So let's compare the damage, right? Clip Cleaver is 48 durability, so it's a little less than the Champion's Chopper. Damage is 65 to 85 versus 60 to 80, so it's weaker. Ugh. Don't like that. So it's 10 damage weaker. Uh, on the champion's chopper 25 percent ignores armor 35 percent ignores armor that's very good for a cleaver 115 percent effective versus armor versus 125 percent effective versus armor so it's you know 
a lot, I mean, you add those two things together, you're very rarely going to fight enemies that are completely unarmored. Even Necrosavats, you know, dude, shirtless vampires, those dudes have armor. So, you know, both of those stats are relevant against most enemies. Uh, it probably adds up, we could sit down and do the math, but it probably adds up to just being a little bit more damage than a Crypt Cleaver. Now, it does way more shield damage. That's great, but it's also a little bit heavier. They're very comparable. Surprisingly enough, they're very comparable. The difference is the attack. So we get Cleave here versus... Hmm, interesting. Let's look at the attack. The, the art has changed, but it's a different damage. Is there anything different about it at all other than the fact that this looks more like a barbarian blade in the artwork? 4 and 12. 4 and 12. The damage is obviously different because they're two different weapons. One more time. 70s. I'm looking here now. Damage versus armor. 76 to 10. Okay. It's just a, I think this is a better weapon, but it's really honestly not by much. It'd be cooler if they had some sort of extra uh, ability attached to it, but it looks sick. And Osbit's going to be the guy that's rocking it. And then here we'll go back to our standard great sword. But man, the man splitter really did a great job in that particular fight. Where do we go now? So the thing is, now you got to find the next location. Does one of these places have a taxidermist? Let's go to Wolfenfest, and as we walk, I'll just look something up real quick. So I know that now the other place will spawn. I'm not sure if it spawns beforehand, but you just can't get into it. I think it's called the Hunting Grounds. Because I still kind of remember what happens there. But I've only ever done it once, like I said. Whoa, big barbarian fight, potentially. A bunch of Reavers. You know what? This is a cool fight. Let's take that. If this is going to be our last episode, we may as well do some real fights. But I, what I'm trying to get at is, I think the hunting grounds only spawn on certain locations, like certain types of tiles. I don't know if the wiki will, will give me that information. Yeah, I would have to go to like... A different maybe like the reddit or something will have that okay whose turn is it man our guy started in such bad positions hmm let's pass pass with our, our people that are currently like in bad spots and then we'll try and push forward all right that's a 61 i'll take that Oh, jeez. Okay. We're going to need to send help up there. He's a lone wolf, but he's not currently like an active lone wolf. Yeah, let's send Damocles up. They've got a shield guy. They could push me. Jeez, let's hope that doesn't happen. And take this spot safely. Okay. This is a pretty good little spot here. Can I shoot anyone? Not really. Get up. I'll take the 37, just I had a feeling I might hit it. Alright, good. I'm happy to see that the, the shield bro decided to back off. That's really good for us. Last thing I want is for him to jump here and then push, and then we fall down here and get really hurt. Yeah, this is too good to pass up, I think. Make sure we take the high ground. Yeah, that's all perfectly safe. Incremental movements. Alright. Don't like to see that. I'm glad he missed the javelin. He went for my shield there. 
Wow. I can't hit like a 68% crossbow shot, but that dude can just chuck a heavy javelin across the map. Nail me. All right, we'll take what shots we can. So there is a Beastmaster somewhere. Come on, man. Take some 30s, hope to get lucky. Cut that guy down. Ah, oh, Dwin Bar, man. All right, let's get up there and really lock him in. I'm scared to jump in there, so we're just going to chill. I could rotate and then attack. Yeah, let's do that. And that was definitely supposed to be an easy kill. Good. We'll clear out these guys. Make the uh, the unhold a, a target that's nice and easy. So I'm really up here. I'm dancing around being pushed off. That's one of those things that I've underestimated in the past. The AI will go for it. They are not scared to try. Make a little room up here, perhaps. Man, I can't believe he's landed half of his shots at like 20%. Or 25%. I don't wanna I don't wanna give wrong numbers just to make myself look good, but damn. Some serious luck. Okay, I'll take applying overwhelm. That feels pretty good. Okay. Soften him up. Man, he took out my shield. That's pretty bad. Oh no, he's on the high ground. Okay. Yeah, sadly, not much I can do about the positioning. And now I think it's smart to uh, try and bring Osbit back down. Definitely our toughest enemy now is going to be this Armored Unhold. We're going to go first here. It's hard to tell what's what. Weird. Okay. Looks like I made a few little movement errors here and there. I want to get down, but Dwinbar is kind of in the way. Alright. Save a little bit of fatigue, I guess. Clear these two out. Okay. A little too tired. Fatigue's not great on Blowers. Wishing he was closer to the 80s. He'd have been able to attack after that. Gotta get this armor down. Okay. I think it's time to switch. Let's get that banner out. Don't know where the Beastmaster is. I have to assume he's up here somewhere. Okay. Happy to fade that attack. That could have been scary. Okay. Yeah, there he is. Man, still alive, eh? Bill hooks come out. Okay. So far, not terrible. I'm actually going to send... No, we're going to keep going. I'm going to send Osbit over here to try and catch that guy. I wish I had figured he was over here last time. I thought he was over here and not up on some crazy high ground. And we're just exhausted. Everybody's good where they are. These guys should both be dead this turn. And even catching him is not a big deal because he's just going to rampage into us. We just kind of want him to sit still for a little while. 
The big thing now is that we applied a few stacks of Overwhelm at least. Man, we cannot hit him. Alright, on it. Damn, that hurt. Ow! Okay. Looks like it's time for a man fight. Ozymandias versus the Unhold. We can bring in Sir Eastwood too. He's doing fine. Do they have bad injuries? Fractured hand? Okay. It looks like maybe that's about it. Brained ankle. That makes sense. He just got knocked off a cliff. My mother-in-law actually just broke her ankle a few days ago. Ugh, she tripped over some like construction supplies. Somebody left in her hallway in the middle of the night. Just completely destroyed her ankle. Hard to recover from stuff like that when you're older, you know. Gotta have one of those little, uh, what do you call those? It's like a little scooter you put under your knee. You gotta be no fun. Man, the angle on this is so bad. We gotta get up here. And we'll just hang back with Blowers. No reason to risk anyone. It's been a long time since I've broken anything. Thank goodness. A few things suck worse than wearing a cast. Oh, we've done that this turn. I'm already, even when I was a kid, I was kind of pale. And whenever you get a cast on, if you've never had a cast, basically what will happen is your skin will start to, like, mold and die. It's very gross. Your hair, if you've got, you know, I was a little bit, you know, I played a lot of sports as a kid, but. So I wasn't completely, like, pale, pale. But when you take the cast off after months of having it, I had it on my left arm. I've had casts on both my my arms and hands uh but whenever you whenever you take it off you'll have one super pale spot that your entire like maybe from your your elbow down and then all of your hair and this is something that i didn't expect will go from being like whatever natural color it is in my instance it was like you know um you know kind of fair colored to like pitch black and it's weird. You look down, you don't even recognize your own arm. It's kind of creepy. Please finish this. Still in the game. He's got lots of overwhelm on him. I would kind of expect him not to be able to hit, but he's still doing okay. He's dead this turn. What a weird... I don't think I've ever had this configuration of land before, where it's like this big road split down the middle of a canyon. It's very odd. Finish him. Perfect. And we get some bones. We can make some more plating. And now it's just up to uh, old Thick Snack. Down he goes. Very cool. Not the world's easiest fight either. Barney gets a level. And that gives us... Some of the crowns that I was hoping... Ooh, he got his level 11. Awesome. Night. Way to do it right before the uh, the series ends. And I'll take a... Uh, take a three. Okay. And then for his final perks... I've been thinking very hard about that video I talked about making where I go into what I believe to be the best perks and some of perhaps the best builds... Uh, but there's so many different things you have to take in consideration when you make claims like that. That the last thing I want to do is make some stupid universal claim about what is the best. Um, I'll probably be doing a lot of like 
these are the builds for certain situations, right? I'll try, I'll try and be a little more methodical about it instead of making like a top 10 stupid video, um, which isn't very, ultimately very helpful. Um, what are we going to go for him? He's got the worst initiative of all time. Could go just something like fast adaptation. And the last one almost doesn't even matter when you consider like how this, this build is actually going. This is Barney. If you wanted to just do a value per, you just go nine lives. It, it, I mean, it doesn't matter. We are popping into Wolf and Fest. And, oh, they've got a, a seasonal fair going on. Just see what kind of cool stuff they might have to sell. I was hoping they might have something unique we could pick up. No, they have a Salet helmet, which we kind of sorely need on our archers. And then here they have the Magnificent Punisher. The one-handed flail, but look how expensive it is. Jesus. Sell off the junk. But yeah, so instead of doing... And I'll sell this too. Instead of doing one of those videos, I was thinking of just waiting until... Our next uh, campaign, which will be out very soon. It's going to be with uh, Deserters. And uh, you know what? Maybe that's not even a good idea. Because when I do the Deserters, I'm I'm a big believer in playing your characters, right? Uh, sometimes you'll get a character, you go to recruit. Let's say I want to pick up a knight. And I already know 100% what I want to do with him. I know the, the build I want to give him. The weapon I want to give him. Um, I know everything that I want to do with this knight. But then I get him, and it turns out he's... Like, I want to make him like my sergeant, let's just say, for instance. And I pick him up, and he's got uh, Paranoid. So his resolve is lower. I think that makes you resolve minus 5, is that correct? Let's say he's just got a bunch of stuff that wrecks his resolve. No, it's initiative. The next wrecks your initiative. Anyway, bad example. Uh, but let's say he's got some stuff, like Cowardly. I don't, I don't remember what the ones that affect your resolve are. Um... And it ruins it. It's like, okay, so this guy's got like minus 10 resolve right off the bat. It's like, okay, change of plans, right? I got to be flexible. I can't just make him my sergeant just because I want that to happen. I've got to like roll with the punches. So I'm a big believer in that. And especially when we do these kind of themed company origins let's plays, I want to kind of let each character evolve sort of naturally, right? As what I need for the company or... You know, what their, their particular traits allow. So it's kind of hard to say one thing is just strictly better than all the others. Um, what are we going to do here? And I'm not sure, I was just going to say, I'm not sure if the Deserter Company Origin is going to be the best one to showcase that. But I have been giving it a lot of thought. And I've been watching, let's see, I've been watching other guys too who do Let's Plays. Who I respect their opinions. I don't always agree with them, but at least I, I do respect their opinions. Um, and sometimes I'll hear something that makes me kind of rethink what my own ideas are, or at least reevaluate a particular uh, perk that I haven't given much thought for a long time. I don't know why he's going this way. I'm trying to go to Alslive. You find Blower sitting by himself outside the camp. As the jeers and cheers of the men surround the campfire crackle behind you, you approach the man and ask what he's sulking for, and he shrugs. Not sulking, sir, just thinking. Though I suppose one could be easily mistaken for the other. Chuckling, he offers a bit of his drink, which you take. Settling down beside him, you ask what it is he is thinking about. The disowned nobleman shrugs again. Ah, nothing really. Just thinking about home. I'm a long ways away from it now, and the last I remember of it isn't exactly the best. Yet I still find myself wishing to be there now and again. Homesick for a land that thinks me a sort of noble sickness. Go figure. You hand him back to his drink and he probably needs it more than you. While you're still clear-headed, you try and speak your mind. Spark the old home, you're with us now. You speak. Where you're from is a house, not a home. You yearn for a different place and a different time when you're in this place right here and right now. The Lightborn Legion looks after you and you it. And only together will we persevere. The man stares into his drink for a time. He chuckles, sips, and wipes the froth away. Yeah, I suppose that's one way to look at it. 
Thank you, Captain. So he's in good spirits and he got plus one resolve. Cool little uh, event there. I don't often have uh, disowned nobles in my party, so that's one I, I don't get to see very often. Cool. And Erdfall is just as good a place as any to go to. I just wanted to visit the taxidermist and make everybody some cool stuff. We're going to pass right by the makeshift fur huts. And head straight to Erdfall. So what I was trying to look up is to see where Hunting Ground spawns. I was kind of looking on the on the map over by these like lakes. I remember it spawns somewhere like close to something like that. And I think it has to spawn in one of those types of terrains. Like near a body of water. Is that correct? It's been it's been a while since I uh, I did that and looked at that. Let's see if someone made a uh, a Reddit or something about that. So we've got the option to make additional fur padding. Crafted from thick furs, this additional padding helps dampen the impact of any blow. Reduces damage ignoring armor by thirty three percent. We can make more bone platings, and I think we can make a bunch of direwolf pelt mantles. Anything else? We can make one more unhold for a cloak. Let's see what we actually have in the numbers that we have it in. So we can make two of the... Okay. Alright, cool. Let's go boom. Boom. Bone plating. Bone plating. Additional fur padding. That's what's up. And we just spread it around. Make everybody look... Like a tough badass. Just reading what other people have put in, like Steam, to say what they've uh, they've struggled with finding and and such. So, do we have any armor that has nothing on it? So, a good thing to give to these male hauberks if you're trying to keep certain characters light is the direwolf pelt mantle. It gives plus fifteen durability, which is great, um, but also. It doesn't weigh anything, so it doesn't it doesn't impact your your fatigue or your initiative, um, and it looks cool as hell. Uh, also, it has the great ability of reduces the resolve of any opponent engaged in melee by five. So at first, that might seem like it might be a little bad for an archer to have that, but if you think about an enemy that closes into melee against an archer, the best thing you can have them do is want to run away. So as soon as they get into melee, they start freaking out. It's really great on your front line, obviously, too, because you can you can panic some enemies uh, very easily. Sometimes that five is just enough to kind of tip the balance. Um, we can also do... I'm tempted to switch this out here. That's kind of a crummy, crummy upgrade on that. This one's been upgraded. This one hasn't. This one has. Yeah, I mean, all of our armor is pretty well done. There you go. Jacob Jacob wanted to look cool. He looks cool now. All right, let's see what people have said about the spawning. And the location is still whenever we've seen. The tundra below the snow area. Hmm. Some people are talking about a bug, perhaps. Wow, this guy had really bad luck. He said his hunting ground spawned, like, all, like his wildlands were all the way to the west, like ours. And his, uh, you know, stuff all the way to the east, just normal, standard stuff. And he said it spawned in the middle of, like, a little tiny mountain range in the middle, all the way as east as he could get. I'm curious, let's go and explore this last little bit here. I would be surprised to find it in our travels. We've got a little bit of time left today. We could certainly perhaps try and face off against the Irajok as part of our last episode. I could see that being pretty damn fun. Buy some bread. We need food. We'll buy an assortment of things. And we need to give this shield to our boy. There we go. And I may as well check the uh, weaponsmith, check the armory. Might see something cool, never seen before. Not today. Some nice heraldic shoulder plates in the color scheme that I actually like, the black and white. Alright, let's keep rolling. And 
We're going to explore this whole area here. But guys, so like I said, Deserter campaign coming up next. Leave me any of your suggestions. I did like a little dry run. And it's a pretty stu uh, tough start. Is very reminiscent to me of our Warriors of the North Let's Play. Because you start with someone hating you. And, you know, you're kind of having to piece stuff together. I've also found that the lack of resolve on the deserters is such a big hindrance. We'll climb this mountain real quick. Okay. Having guys in your, in your company that have like 25, 30 resolve is just rough. Trying to get them up to a normal amount, even 40, which I consider to be like the bare minimum for late game. Is so difficult because you're taking away from their combat stats. So we're definitely not going to find the hunting grounds on the roads. So we might as well come down here. Stick to the mountains. And who knows, we might find something else. Some other unique place. I was kind of hoping it would be in here. How cool would that be? But two things don't usually spawn right next to each other like that. So I think we're safe to kind of move on. I mean, for all I know, it's in here, you know. Okay, 21 undead. What are they? Ah, couldn't get them. Oh, I found the ancient statue. That's cool. We can do that before we go. It's just a lot of reading, mostly. But that's pretty fitting to end on the ancient statue. It's probably the biggest source of lore uh, in the game. We can close out on that if you guys want. I'm excited to get more lore in Blazing Deserts. I'm, I'm, I've got questions, like, Battle Brothers is an awesome game, and part of what makes it great is kind of like the mystique of, they don't really ever tell you everything, you know? Some things you just kind of have to piece together from reading, you have to learn yourself. Flowers get some fatigue from running around. And it adds like a mystique, and, you know, I was watching a, uh, a show last night that was talking about movies, and they were talking about how... Uh, in Jurassic Park, Steven Spielberg waits a long time to kind of show off the T-Rex. And I thought that was actually pretty smart, if it was intentional. Because it builds, like, suspense and it builds drama. And sometimes not showing a thing, like in horror movies, not showing it until the last minute, is how you build, uh, you know, suspense within your audience. And it's kind of the same thing with, uh, with Battle Brothers. The story is never just given to you. It's never, you know, 100% known. Makes it more interesting in a way. We can just uncover all this fog. The tomb of Sir Cunibert. Could test it. I'd much rather just keep exploring. Let's come down here. We've got two more days worth of food. Uh, that's not a lot. Or are we just in the mountains and it's messing us up? Yeah, we were in the mountains. We got four days worth. Okay. Follow the road a little bit. Yeah, I am eager to see how they flesh out the story even more. The Ifrit reveal was kind of cool. Um, I'm a fan of what they're doing with the enemy type. I just don't know if... A lot of people have pointed out what Ifrits kind of normally are traditionally. And I'm curious what they're drawing their idea of... Uh, like a stone golem, essentially. From. Because it is an interesting idea. It's not a bad idea. We've got a leader there. You know what? Let's go kill him for old time's sake. We'll take a leader. Head over to Sandberg and eat some food. I don't know if we're gonna. I don't know if we're gonna accomplish our mission of finding and fighting the Earjock. This this playthrough would have to just keep going, which obviously I don't hate. You guys have have been great in watching these these series. Um, they are definitely some of my more successful videos on YouTube, which I I really appreciate. I know there's a lot of options probably for Battle Brothers content, and I always just hope you guys like to hang out. I think he had a fighting axe before he switched. So no, nothing unique coming from him. I'll take two 52s. Yes. 
Beautiful. Okay, not so beautiful. I wanted to get rid of the guy with the the scary long sword. Man, we're missing stuff we just really shouldn't be. I was going to say, just hit him in the head and he's gone. Fifty-nine. Sure. Let's pull up behind. Less likely to get sniped. Go first there. Get a better surround here. Alright. And that's a major freak out. And obviously, guys, new DLC is just great for me and my channel. Um, every time they're going to come out with a new uh, Battle Brothers, either DLC, FLC, whatever, you know I'm going to cover it. And I've been fortunate that whenever you know they do that, I pick up several more subscribers. So I just want to say if you're new to the channel, uh, I appreciate you checking it out and giving it a chance. If you're watching this as your first episode, perhaps... Then maybe it's a little strange because I, I'm kind of like leaving this series behind. If you don't understand the premise of my Company Origins campaign, uh, I basically I came off of two very long Let's Plays. One when the the uh, Beast and Exploration DLC popped, I beat the game from start to finish, right, and it was a great campaign, uh, but very very time consuming. And then I did it again because Warriors of the North came out pretty damn soon after that. Uh, relative speaking to how like fast DLC usually you know becomes available. And uh, so you know I got not burnout perhaps isn't the right word, but it takes a lot out of you to go to like a 600 day, multiple 600 day campaigns. I mean that stuff is crazy. It's a lot of time in a game that I had already you know cleared put it into perspective. So it's nice to have fresh content, I guess is what I'm saying. Because I love Battle Brothers. I don't really want it to end. I see nothing but potential. Uh, I love the inclusion of the grenades. Uh, we'll have to see how else, what else they implement. Uh, in addition to this, kind of the minor reveal that I didn't, I didn't really jump on it as much as I feel like I should have in my, uh, my, the video where I covered the update. Kind of like the dev blog uh, review video. I don't know what you would call it. Um, nice. Perfect. We get the fighting axe. That was the real prize there. The armor is useless. Fighting Axe is just an expensive thing. Man, that guy's on point. He blocked everything. Got a shield wall up. That's not surprising. But yeah, the... Uh, man, I keep getting sidetracked by myself. I do that all the time. Uh, the, the big kind of, like, hidden reveal there was that alchemy is going to be a thing. So in the same way that, like, in this episode today, I visited the Tachyzodermist. Damn, we're whiffing left and right. This man is a god. So an alchemist. Who? I mean, who even knows what we're, we're going to do there? I'm wondering if they're going to move, like, potions from the Tachyzodermist to the alchemist. I've said since the beginning that I wish they had changed or not implemented potions the way they did. They're expensive... They're time-consuming to produce, uh, and they're one-off effects that often really aren't even that great. So I was very, I was looking forward a lot to like consumables, um, but they're just they're too expensive. There are parts, obviously, when you're in your super super late game, where like money is no object. Uh, you've got huge, you know, wagon space, 
And maybe you're just collecting stuff. You're just killing stuff en masse. Uh, but for the longest time, it's... Like, I haven't made a single potion. I, I don't know if I've ever... Used a potion in combat... Without forcing myself to do it. Like, it's not, it's not an integral part of the game. And I wish they had implemented it in such a way that it made you want to use potions. It made, like, bags and belts perk... Like, really, really viable. Like, poison is really strong... It refills uh, at a certain, maybe they're, like now it could be an alchemist, right? You go to an alchemist, you pay a little bit of money, and you refill your empty vials, right? You make the vials once, you learn the recipe, you make the vials, and then you just refill them uh, for cheap, right? In the same way that you refill all of these other things, right? And in that way, you're kind of encouraged to use, and this is just me spitballing, guys, so don't take this, you know, as like my be-all, end-all solution. Um, but just a way to encourage you to make use of a good of a good idea. Kind of just my thoughts on it. I wish I wish there was more incentive to do that. Anyway, let's go and explore this last bit. Hope to get lucky, find something cool. There's some swamp down here. We could even potentially. Oh no. We've done this many times before, and this is actually the event that I've had before, I think, that I ended my Warriors of the North Let's Play on. It was kind of an emotional ending. I didn't snitch on these guys. Feel free to read that if you like. We're going to lie and say we haven't seen them around. Haven't seen them. It says, with your fingers still pointing the wrong way, the overseers take off. Their angry barking fades into the distance. When they're gone, the laborers slowly emerge. They appear rather surprised that a sellsword didn't sell word of them in the bushes. One by one, they take off their hats and bless you for your mercy. One even calls it justice. A strange word in a mercenary's ear. Farewell. So, I think that's what it was. When I signed off after like 100 plus episodes of my Wars of the North Let's Play. Right as I was saying goodbye, that popped. And I got to say farewell. It was very cool. I was thinking we might even find the, uh, like the Kraken area in the swamps over here or something. That would not surprise me. We haven't found the water mill. Another brigand leader. This place probably has some unique loot. I love islands. I, would, I do wish there were a few more islands in the game. Alright, let's head back up. And I guess we'll close today on the ancient statue. Let's go and do that. For those of you who have never seen that lore... It's the most loreful thing about the game. It's a lot of reading. If you've seen it a million times already, please feel free to, to fast forward the video to the end. Fast forward. I'm so old, y'all. In my mind, when I say the words fast forward, I legitimately think of VCRs. And the sounds they made when you would fast forward. Ten dire wolves. Where were you guys when I was looking for you? Like in the entire early game. Alright, here we go. A golden man the size of a castle sits atop his stone throne with such august stature. It seems even he, as inanimate as he is, should rule the land. And perhaps the world would be better for it. This non-speaking entity with such awesome presence would make a finer ruler than a lot of skunks you constantly run into. The bulk of the statue rests upon an enormous disc made of spiraling square stones. Were they coffins, it would take all of two bricks to store the Lightborn Legion whole. Bjarni hits his helm up, or tilts his helm up. If it ain't the biggest thing i ever seen, I don't know what is. Gustav Fring smirks and makes a reach for the cell sword's crotch. I thought the women folk said that little worm was the biggest thing to ever seen. <laughs> Stupid. As the company laughs, you step forward and look up. You're not much for kneeling, but you feel the urge here. The statue is staring out at the world with firm authority, and its hands are out at the sides, one upon a sword staked into the earth and the other supinated as though to weigh justice herself. You nod at the golden sheen present before you, that there is not a single scratch of a would-be robber suggest its austere presence still has some ethereal grip on the world. But that doesn't make sense. Any smart man would be nicking a fair share from the statue's shins alone. A few mercenaries ask if they can have a stab at collecting some gold for themselves. There's no harm in it. The statue is so huge, perhaps it scared off the lesser scapegraces by superstition alone. You've no reason to let a good thing go, like a nearly endless pile of gold shaped into something pretty. 
To hell with history and the artistry. You tell the men to have it. They leap to the task with the tools available, but the second Osbit thick snack makes contact, he falls limp and slumps against the statue. Another mercenary goes to help him, brushes the enormous toe there, and collapses atop the cell sword, just like those fainting goats. Just as the company begins to panic, the two mercenaries bolt back to their feet and start screaming about amazing sights, sights beyond this world, sights of the future itself. Invigorated by this, the company gladly runs themselves into the statue, the lot banging against its giant toes and falling backward like mines, unexpectedly finding a very real wall. It's the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen, but each man springs back to his feet, spilling out fantastic stories. You shrug and walk up to the statue yourself, standing before the big toe with its big toenail. The men urge you forward, sighing. You put your hand out and touch the toenail. Nothing. Nothing happens. You fist the gap between the nail and the golden flesh. You angrily put both hands to the toe like it owes you money. Nothing. Well then, looks like you've riches to harvest. You draw your sword out. Time to strike gold. You swing the sword, but the second steel touches gold, the sheen of the world flashes over you as though you'd struck the sun itself and drew blood. The sword continues on into the darkness like a star across the night sky, and it cuts a world of its own into reality, as though you'd slash the magician's cloth of his trick, revealing a room with pillared corners and beautiful silk curtains, and the sword continues on until it slams against the spear shaft. You look down to see a man with gilded armor and red eyes holding his guard with a grimace. He slides across the tiled floor to his right, and let your momentum fall to the ground. Then he twirls the spear around his back and strikes it forward. You throw your arm wide and close rank with the killer, catching the spear shaft beneath your armpit and driving forward to stab him just beneath his pauldron. Driving the sword into the heart, the man's red eyes drain to a pure white, and he goes limp and slides right off the steel. As he clatters to the ground, you quickly look around. Against the far wall stands an enormous bed with corners made of marble, each statue shaped to a woman or man, each of them adorned submissively, what looks like a rising sun. There's an elderly man in the bed who is looking at you, bearded, eyes dim, weathered. Familiarity in his stare. He smiles, but it quickly fades. He yells, but you don't understand the words. A shadow slides across the room, and you wheel around to see a large knight with fire in his eyes bearing down with a two-hander. Parry! You step back and flip your sword crosswise and crunch at the knees to brace for impact, or crouch at the knees. The killer's two-hander slams against your sword, and just like that, the world snaps away, and still frozen in a parry, you can feel the issuance of time and space fly by your sides like a plow wind, and ungodly amounts of suffering, screaming, living and dying, and in the far distance a speck of light that fast approaches until you arrive back in your body, and your sword hits the statue and swings backward so hard it flies out of your hands and sails through the air, until stabbing into the earth with an enormous chunk. The men look about one another. You go and fetch your sword. I think you broke it, sir says Daniel's the positive as he gets handsy with the pinky toe. You tell him and the rest of the men to pack their things. It's time to leave this place. Looking at the statue, you see that it is all rusted bronze now. You think to ask one of the mercenaries if it had been gold earlier, but you already know the answer to that. Instead, you stare at the head of the statue, at the face, at the very familiar face. Let's not dwell on this. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed our Lone Wolf Let's Play. Um, I think the fascinating, just as closing thoughts, I think the fascinating part of this Let's Play is definitely in the early game and trying to figure out how best to keep your brother alive, uh, the different perks and strategies that you need in order to be one man versus ten, you know, that's, that's really cool, um, and having that ability to chop down three guys with a single stroke, that, that's cool. And then in the mid game, you basically turn into an absolutely average game, uh, where the goal is... I would say to try not to just recruit any old guy. Stay low. Stay low to the ground as long as you can. Your early game will last a long time. Your mid game will last forever. Uh, because I think what you're trying to do is make a bunch of money, buy a hedge knight. Make a bunch of money, buy a noble. Make a bunch of money, buy a sword master. Right? You're trying to fill your 12 slots with the best characters you can. Um, and making your synergies around it. I had every intention of doing that with this let's play uh but the i could tell the mid game was going to drag on forever before i could actually see to fruition uh the type of let's play that i wanted to do here um but at the end of the day it was still super fun we had a lot of adventures and then obviously the real difficulty comes in the the late game where you start losing people that are level you know 11 12 13 14 and you've got to replace them with someone that's level six right 
Um, that's it's time consuming. It's just purely time consuming. Um, I understand why people play this. If you're playing on uh, or iron mode where guys die and that's it, uh, you can't save the game at certain times. Like this could this could give you that challenge that you need uh, if you're that type of gamer. Personally, uh, I enjoy a more relaxed pace. I enjoy not having to you know waste a bunch of time retraining up a guy just so I can go into this one fight when I could just reload and then jump into the fight anyway, you know, instead of losing the guy. So, hopefully you guys enjoyed this Let's Play. You enjoyed, you know, some of my thoughts and opinions on uh, strategies. Maybe it was insightful, maybe not. Uh, but look forward to the next one, where we go into the Deserters. And I'm going to be looking for new names. If anyone wants to join, uh, now's a good time. You can let me know in this comment section, and I'll take notes and write them down. And they'll be ready to go. Uh, you could end up being one of our first three deserters. And that could be uh, pretty cool. So without any further ado, y'all, thank you so much for watching. Once again, my name is Brett. My channel is Good Talk Gaming. And uh, look forward every Friday as we get more news on Blazing Deserts. If you want to see that, it'll be up on my channel. All right, y'all. Take care, and I will see you in the next one. Later, guys. And later from uh, Ozymandias as well. Peace.